Welcome back. If you recall, in episode one, we looked at some of the risks AWS thinks about when building and managing our services. We spoke about the risk of change or deployments, and also about plain old bugs. This is the resilience of the cloud itself. And you'll remember from the resilience equation that this is AWS's responsibility. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at the teams behind the AWS services to understand some of their operational practices and really importantly, how they deploy updates. I'm really excited to say that I'm joined today by Elaine Harvey, Director of AWS Reliability Services. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you, Rob. Firstly, could you tell me a little bit about what you own at AWS? I own uh, services and programs that are focused on helping customers build more reliable workloads in the cloud. That includes the fault injection service, which is our chaos engineering capability that helps customers test and prove the reliability of what they've built and are operating. And thinking about the teams that operate those services, how are those teams made up? We construct those teams of multidisciplinary, small teams that own their service end to end. Typically eight to 12 people is normal. So they are the single threaded owners of their service. And by making a single team responsible for coding features, testing their code, deploying and responding in production if there are any issues, it gives them the motivation to ensure that they not only design and structure it well, they deploy carefully and that they have their systems instrumented in production so that if they get paged in, they can quickly discover what's going on. So they're all carrying pages as well. Yes. And we call those teams two pizza teams, is that right? We do, yeah. You can feed them with two pizzas. We keep them that small. Two American-sized pizzas. Yes, two very large American-sized pizzas. So what I thought we could do is follow an imaginary service all the way through from being created to being deployed out into production. So if you could talk me through, how would we start with a new service being created? Like most things at Amazon, we start by working backwards. So we start with what's called a PR FAQ. So it's a PR press release at frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. And through that, we define the core value to customers. And that's not just written by a product manager or a business owner. That's written collaboratively between the product manager and the engineers. Mm -hmm. And they define the key characteristics that they want out of the new service. And they might do a lot of engineering experiments along the way. They may build a proof of concept to prove out a point, to prove that they can achieve certain behaviors or functionality as they go along. So they're experimenting while they're defining what they're building. And how do they make sure that the service they're creating meets the standard and incorporates all our institutional learning? We have a process called Operational Readiness Review, or mm -hmm. ORR. And that system or process contains both a set of axioms that define key characteristics that we require in all our services. A great example would be um, a regional service must be able to sustain the loss of a complete availability zone. Yeah. And underneath that axiom, there'll be a series of requirements. For example, a regional service needs to maintain sufficient capacity all the time such that it can lose an AZ worth of capacity and still not interrupt customer service. So there's a, a number of those axioms in the ORR that get included when the team is designing the service. So think of them as sort of non-functional requirements. And as part of that ORR, we also have a broad set of learnings and best practices that we have discovered over the decades of operating a large scale cloud of ways to achieve what are required of the system that they're building. Excellent, thanks. So let's assume now that the team is, has passed through the operational readiness review and they're building their service and getting ready to deploy. How does it make its way out into production? Sure, we have a very rigorous deployment process. Change can be scary to humans. And there is a natural resistance in a human to want to slow down change in order to increase safety. And at the pace that we innovate, um, the side effect would be that if you delayed changes and you only deployed once a month or once every two months, you would accumulate so much change in one deployment that a disaster would almost be inevitable. So we know that, in fact, it's safer to deploy smaller increments of change much more frequently. But you can't do that without a lot of automation in place. Mm -hmm. So our teams go through um, you know, all of the typical practices that you would expect, like peer code reviews, um, testing, all the unit testing, integration testing that you would expect 
a change to go through before it goes out to production, but we have a very strong emphasis on automation. We believe that if a test is worth running, it's worth automating. So the typical flow is a, a team member, an engineer, will check a change into the change control system, and it's automatically then checked out and code reviewed. Once it's passed code review, it goes into our automated pipelines, where the pipeline will pick it up and put it into a unit testing stage. Think of it as a unit testing environment. Mm -hmm. And it runs through the complete set of unit tests that have been contributed to by the entire team over time, so they accumulate. After the unit test environment, it will run into a pre-production environment, like an integration environment that very closely resembles production. And it goes through another set of uh, automated tests in that environment that rigorously test the system. It will typically go through a load testing stage as well. All of this happens automatically. And as it goes through each of these stages, if it doesn't pass a test, the deployment is halted and rolled back. Yeah, so we have a real focus on rollback safety as part of this process as well. Indeed, and that includes into production. So as a change goes through all of these stages of testing, eventually it reaches a state where it's approved to go to production. And it begins to deploy, again, automatically. There are no human hands on this. Yeah. So we deploy first to what we call a one box, which is a single machine in a single availability zone. And the change gets deployed there, and it gets to sit in that box receiving customer traffic for a period that we call a bake time. Mm -hmm. And that bake time can be measured in minutes, typically hours would be more common. And the intent is to let the change run in production on that one box receiving a very small percentage of customer traffic, including um, synthetic traffic that we send to it as well, so that we can see if there's some kind of abnormality in behavior that has escaped all of our automated testing, we'll be able to observe it on the one box. Not humans, automated systems will observe yes. it. So yeah. our observability is looking for any variances in behavior. If it detects a variance in behavior and alarm fires, it'll get rolled back off of that one box. But if it doesn't and it succeeds, we then deploy to the rest of the hosts in that AZ for that service. And again, it enters a bake time and then onward. And then it'll go to a single box in another AZ in another region, and it has a bake time, and then it goes to the rest. And then there are some variances in deployment patterns after that, but eventually it will fan out worldwide, but very slowly with bake times at each phase. And that can take a number of weeks to get all around the globe to all 36 regions. That Absolutely, are there right now. yeah. The key is, though, that the automation is doing it. And automation has a level of patience and care and paranoia that a human would be incapable of. So while the system is rolling that change out worldwide, meanwhile, the developer is off working on something else. So they're not manually deploying anything. So they can be working on the next feature, the next change. So if I understood all that correctly, if I play that back, if I'm an engineer working on one of the service teams for one of the services that you own, and I make one of these small changes, that will be, from that point onwards, completely handled by our automated tooling. And that could make its way out to 34 out of 36 AWS regions before a problem is detected. And then it could be rolled back all the way, and that change sent back to me. Is that all right? the way is that back? Correct? Yep. The That's system amazing. will roll the change all the way back out of production, and the developer is alerted, and then they have to go investigate what occurred. And then typically there would be a change to their change to correct anything that was found, and that change has to go through the whole process again. Again, code review, testing environments, rolling out through stages, rolling through production. Thank you for explaining the continual efforts to improve our resilience so clearly, Elaine. But we're not saying goodbye to Elaine, as she will join me in the next episode, where we'll be looking further behind the scenes at AWS, covering how do we do service monitoring and how the teams operate. See you there. <laughs>